Revelation chapter 14, going to be talking about the 144,000. I have a little different take than the, um, uh, the traditional evangelical one. And at somewhere along the way, Sue, I'll want to put up that little uh, uh, timeline if you have it there handy. Not, not at the moment, but a little later. 144,000, and I, I believe that I'm a part of the 144,000. I believe some of you are, and I'll tell you how we can know that we're part of the 144,000. But first I want to read, uh, I just felt to read a couple of scriptures about the Lord's coming. Uh, the first one is uh, Acts chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. And it says, Now when he, that is Jesus, had spoken these things, while they watched, he was, he was taken up. While they watched, he was taken up. And a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. I think this is obvious. These were angels in the forms of men in white apparel who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. So now, now listen to this for a moment. They said, this same Jesus whom you have seen go up into heaven, he ascended in a cloud, he shall come in like manner. The same Jesus, not a different one, the same Jesus. Now, they have been interacting with Jesus over a 40-day period in his resurrection body. He came out of the tomb. Um... He wasn't a spirit. He had a physical body. A physical body no longer that was that the life was in the blood, but, uh, but a physical body that was uh, functioned on the life of the spirit. The, the, the principle of life was spirit. And this physical body was not uh, confined to physical spaces. Jesus could be anywhere he wanted to be. When he wanted to be there, he didn't have to go through doors. He could be anywhere he wanted to be at the speed of thought. And, uh, but it was a real physical body. He talked with them. He ate with them. He showed them the scars in his hands and offered. He let them touch him and, and put their fingers in the holes in his hands and in his side. A real physical Jesus raised from the dead in resurrection life and power. And this is the one they're watching go up into heaven. And the two uh, men, as it says, angelic beings there, they say, men of Galilee, this same Jesus that you've seen go into heaven shall come, so come in like manner, he'll come back as you have seen him go. So this was not fulfilled on the day of Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit. It wasn't fulfilled in A.D. 70. It has not been fulfilled by some spiritual coming of Jesus. <laughs> they said this same Jesus, this physical Jesus that you've seen go up, he's going to come in the like manner that you've seen him go. And of course, Jesus said similar things at different times, but I was just thinking of this one in Matthew chapter, chapter uh, 24, verse 30. Jesus said, then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming. They will see with their physical eyes, not a spiritual coming. They'll see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So my friends, this has not yet been fulfilled. And I know that there are people, we have friends who think that Jesus came in A.D. 70 and called the preterist uh, uh, theory or approach, but my friends, no, uh, not, Jesus did not come in some spiritual coming and fulfill what we see here. This same Jesus, this physical Jesus, this resurrected Lord, he's coming back in the clouds of glory once again. Hallelujah. And so I, I wanted to just, for some reason, I just wanted to read that and to make that clear. So we can go over now and we can go ahead and we can turn to Revelation chapter 14. And while you're doing that, go ahead and look at uh, your outline. And uh, if you want an outline, you, uh, you know, we'll be happy to send you one. But uh, we did take registration and there are about 21 people who registered for this uh, teaching, for this course, and they received an outline. Um, 
But I had some things I wanted to say about prophecy, both end time prophecy and about the New Testament gift of prophecy. And Roman numeral one, I said it like this, because this will help us not only in studying Revelation and Daniel, but even understanding the, the New Testament gift of prophecy. And this statement is very important, Roman numeral one. We must remember that biblical prophecy is more about foretelling than foretelling. What do I mean by that? Forthtelling and foretelling. Foretelling is talking about the future. Forthtelling. A, it is more about speaking the mind and heart of God to a situation than satisfying human curiosity about the future. There is in human nature, all human nature, maybe it's a part of fallen human nature, there is this human curiosity, and I would call it a carnal curiosity about the future. That is why there are psychics and astrologers and fortune tellers and palm readers everywhere. And they've always been around <coughs> for as long as we have recorded human history. They were there in, in, you know, in Israel, in the Old Testament, because there is this human curiosity about the future. Interesting, God ordered Israel to stay away from those people because <laughs> he wanted them to trust him with their future. Now, this is why the Old Testament prophets, talking about the difference in foretelling and foretelling. Look at B. This is why the message of the Old Testament prophets was always calling the people of Israel back to God. It wasn't about telling their fortunes and telling them what was going to happen to them in the future. When that happened, any future predictions were incidental to their priority of addressing their relationship with God and their departure from God and His ways. That's what I call our calling forth telling, speaking God's heart and mind to the situation. And the Old Testament prophets, they weren't about predicting the future. They were about calling people to repentance and back to God. And any future predictions that they made were incidental to that priority. Look at C, neither end time biblical prophecy or the New Testament gift of prophecy is about satisfying human curiosity about the future. And when we approach it in that manner, we are going to be disappointed. <laughs> I was just thinking of an incident. Well, there have been so many incidents. You know, I mean, uh, I, 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 I am not a spring chicken anymore. I've been around. You know, I mean, I, I, was, I grew up in church. The, the first remembrances I have of people speaking in tongues and people experiencing the Spirit and people preaching about the Lord coming and making predictions and so on. And so I've lived long enough to see so many things that people claim God said didn't happen and predicting this and predicting that. I mean, now, now God does. The Bible says the Holy Spirit will show us things to come. But the Holy Spirit shows us things to come, not just to, to satisfy our curiosity about the future. Let me give you an example. Uh, this was way back many years ago, early days of our ministry in St. John, New Brunswick. We had a Christian school, and I had a dream from God. I do believe God speaks in dreams. It's not his normal way of speaking. And this whole thing today, this fad today about in, uh, dream interpretation is totally unbiblical. Nonetheless, God does speak in dreams. It's not his normal way. I would say in uh, serving the Lord almost 50 years, I've probably had three or four dreams that were, were for sure from the Lord. And uh, this particular one, we had a Christian school, and we had a young couple. They were a nice young couple. I'm sure they loved the Lord. You know, they were immature and, and so on. And uh, they were the administrators of our school and taught in it. And I had a dream. I was the official principal of the school. And I had a dream that I was going to fire them or I was going to let them go. You know, fire sounds like such a harsh word. Doesn't it? <laughs> but I dreamed that I was, I, was going to, I was going to dismiss them, let them go. And, and when I had the dream, I knew it was from God. Didn't understand it, but I knew it was from God. Now, why did God give me that dream? Well, I don't know how long it was after that, but it came, you know, people were sharing with us, you know, this couple. Um, apparently they didn't like how 
we were doing things and you know they just got they didn't like us and how we were doing things but instead of talking to us they were apparently talking to other people in town and other churches and so on and of course it came back to us now if I had not had that dream I would have been very reluctant and hesitant to dismiss them but when that happened I knew what I had to do and God gave me that dream so that I would do the right thing when the time came because he knew my personality I wouldn't have want to, I wouldn't want to do that <laughs> So he gave me that dream, not just to satisfy some curiosity about the future, but so that I would do the right thing when a certain situation arrived. And so this is my point in saying, in time biblical prophecy, the gift of prophecy is not about just telling people's fortunes and satisfying human curiosity about the future. No, God does it for a purpose, to speak to our hearts, to speak to our lives, to help us get our lives in line and closer to him. And so that is very, very important to understand. And when we approach it in a manner, and, and, and uh, this whole what they call the prophetic movement today, this is where much of it is off track, is people are approaching it in this thing that they're running here and there to get a word. They're curious about my future. And, and it, it gets into a whole area of fortune telling rather than a gift of God where God is speaking into our lives and addressing our situations and helping us to know what we need to do to adjust our lives so that we can fulfill His will and His purpose. Now, that being said, chapter 14, remember when John wrote this, he didn't write in chapters and verses. In chapter 13, which we dealt with in the last session, uh, we were talking about the mark of the beast and the number of his name in 666. And if you didn't hear that lesson, you need to go back and see it. I don't know if that lesson has been uh, edited and put on YouTube, but I will look into getting it up. And I know there was some confusion about the numbering. Uh, I had one person to write me. They couldn't find lesson seven. And I think there was some confusion in the numbering. And as soon as I get a little time on my hands, I'm going to go and look at that and get the numbering right, and we'll get them all together. But I, if you didn't get see the lesson on... Uh, uh, the beast whose number is 666. Be sure and, and listen to that. Now, so chapter 14, you know, we tend to turn our minds off, but when John wrote this, it flows together. And he goes from verse 18 where he says, Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man is number 666. Then I looked, and behold, a lamb... We know who the Lamb is, standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, and with him 144,000, touched the wire, and with him 144,000, having his Father's name written on their foreheads. So look at your notes. Roman numeral 2. Chapter 14 introduces a shift from the scenes of horror related to the reign of Antichrist to a reassurance to God's people of his faithfulness in the midst of every trial and every tribulation and, and to let us know that God always has his people in every situation, in every place, God has his people. Roman numeral 3. John sees the Lamb, we know that's Jesus, on Mount Zion. When he's talking about the Lamb, it's emphasizing his uh, sacrificial gift, his sacrificial uh, gift of salvation to humanity, the, the Lamb who was slain. And so, Roman numeral 3, John sees the Lamb on Mount Zion with 144,000 who have his Father's name written in their forehead. A. I said this. This is in sharp contrast to the followers of the beast. No, we didn't say this. Now he's just talking about the beast, and now he goes into these. But notice the contrast. The followers of the beast, they have his mark in their forehead, which could be symbolic of their consciousness or on their right hand. But these, 
they have the Father's name on their forehead. Look at B. Throughout Scripture, a person's name is bound up with the person and character of the one the name represents. For example, God changed Abram's name to Abraham to reflect his God-given destiny. <coughs> God changed Jacob's name, which, meant, which was a negative name, which meant usurper, um, someone who's trying to get ahead of somebody else. He changed his name from Jacob to Israel to reflect his change of character and his divine destiny. A person's name represented who they were, their character. And number three, to have the Father's name written on their forehead means perhaps that they have so identified with the Father as to have his character stamped upon their very being, that they have taken on his heart, his plan, his purpose and character. They are so identified with God that they have his name stamped upon their being, written on their forehead. Oh, are we that identified with God? May we be, may we be. Now, yes, Sue. Okay. So we're getting a little static in our, our microphone. Some noise. Okay. It seems to be where, the, where you press against the connection. Okay, all right. Now, who is this 144,000? Now, uh, Sue, do you have that, uh, that timeline available that we could look at? And I'll tell you, the, I'll just mention the uh, traditional view, which, you know, I, I'm, I'm not here to throw it out or against it, but I'll tell you what I think about it. So there you see the traditional view and two interpretive approaches, the, the futurist interpretation and the historical interpretation. And of course, as I've mentioned before, the futurist interpretation places everything, I see, I see, but I don't need to look back. I can see it right here in front of me. Uh, the futurist interpretation says that everything in Revelation after chapter 3 takes place at the end of the age in this seven-year period. The historical approach says, no, these things are taking place throughout church history. They, they, they have an application for our lives throughout history. Uh, I believe that John affirms this, and we read this passage the last time when he said, um, uh, you have heard John in his epistle, the same John that wrote Revelation, he said that you have heard that Antichrist is coming, and even now there are many Antichrist. In other words, the spirit of Antichrist is already at work. There's application right now, John said, even way back then, to this whole idea. And so the, event, the, the common evangelical interpretation, uh, which actually is a new one, it's from within the, probably the last 100, 150 years, is that this 144,000 are 144,000 Jewish evangelists who preach the gospel to all the world after the church is taken out in what's called the rapture. Then these 144,000 Jewish evangelists are unleashed and they preach the gospel to all of the world during this, uh, uh, within this seven year tribulation period. Now, this is usually based on the fact that in chapter 7, this 144,000 is also mentioned, uh, and they are described as being from the 12 tribes of Israel, 12,000 from each tribe. Now, here is something that is very interesting about this that I, I'll just kind of throw in with this. In chapter 7, where he lists 12,000 from the tribe of Reuben, 12,000 from the tribe of Simon, 12,000 from the tribe of Judah, and he goes down and lists all of them, he leaves out one of the tribes. He leaves out one of the tribes. He leaves out the tribe of Asher. Now, why does he leave out the tribe of Asher? Uh, we may have a clue to this in Genesis chapter 49, and I think that it is in okay well i'm going to make a a change here sue and see if i 
you move it and put it on another way and we'll see if that makes a difference. In Genesis 49, Jacob is blessing his sons, his 12 sons before he dies. And he speaks to each one of them. He speaks blessing over them and speaks about their destiny and about their future. Listen to what he said about Dan. Now, this is the tribe that John left out of his list. And I'm reading from the NIV because it makes it much more vivid. And this is in verse 17. Jacob said, Dan will be a snake by the roadside. Wow. What a prophecy. Dan will be a snake by the roadside, a viper along the path that bites the horse's heel so that its rider tumbles backward. That's what Jacob spoke about the destiny and future of his son Dan and his descendants. I'll read that again. Dan will be a snake by the roadside, a viper along the path. And so when John lists the 12 tribes and says 12,000 out of each tribe, he leaves out Dan. And so there came very early, and as I showed in the last lesson, how, I mean, people have been theorizing about the Antichrist. We read from uh, uh, the writings of Irenaeus, who was a disciple of Polycarp, who was a disciple of John, how uh, the, the different theories that had arisen even in the second and third centuries about who the Antichrist might be. And there arose very early an idea that the Antichrist would come out of the tribe of Dan and that that's why <laughs> John left him out and replaced him with one of the sons of Joseph, uh, I believe either Manasseh or Ephraim, but he replaced him with one of the, tri one of the sons of Joseph. Now, I believe that instead of being literally 144,000 Jews, that this is symbolic language. Now, I gather this from chapter 14 because let's, let's, let's keep reading here. Or let's go ahead and look at the, uh, let's look at the outline. Under, under D, that they represent God's people of all races is indicated by 14.4 where John says they were purchased from among mankind. So here it is said, do you have verse 4? It says, these are the ones. I think I should just go ahead and, and, and I'm going to start reading at verse 1 and go ahead all the way down through verse 5. And then we'll go back to the outline. He says, Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, like the voice of many waters, and like the voice of loud thunder. And I heard the sound of harpists playing their harps. They sang, as it were, a new song before the throne, before the living creatures and the elders. And no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. These are the ones who were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. These were redeemed from among men, or the word is anthropoi, from among humanity. They were redeemed from humanity. They're not confined to just uh, the 12 tribes of Israel, they were redeemed from humanity being first fruits to God and to the Lamb. Now, I want to look at some of the characteristics of this 144,000, what it says about them. First of all, I'm going to look at verse 4, and it says that they were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. I am convinced, you see, this is symbolic language. It's not talking about them being literal, physical virgins. It's talking about the fact that they have never compromised their faith. Now, I'm going to have to reiterate just a little bit here again. Remember the context in which John is writing this. John is writing from the Isle of Patmos where he has been banished because of his faith. The evil emperor, Roman emperor, uh, uh, 
trying to think of his name. Diocletian, thank you, Sue. Diocletian has announced and proclaimed himself as Lord and God and is commanding homage and worship and sacrifices to be offered up to him throughout the Roman Empire. And Christians, uh, they are bidding, being put to the test and many of them are losing their jobs and their livelihood and their means of making a living because they will not compromise their faith. Some are being imprisoned. Some are being put to death. John has been banished to this island out in, in the Mediterranean. And, let me, and so this is what stood out to me. I studied Revelation as a new Christian and used to preach on it. And then my dogmatism was kind of shattered by studying Christian history and realizing that people have been trying to figure out Revelation for the past 2,000 years. But uh, in the last year in teaching Revelation again in two different Bible studies and going through Revelation, it stood out to me so powerfully that the whole book of Revelation is about not compromising the faith. In the light of all that God's people is going to go through in this evil world where where the spirit of Antichrist is at work in some places more powerfully than others. That Christians' faith again and again are going to be put to the test. And it is a call, a warning, exhortation. Don't compromise your faith in Jesus. And I came to see, wow, this is a theme that runs all through Revelation, even in the letters to the seven churches, is a call, don't compromise your faith. Now, this 144,000, I am convinced that this is a symbolic picture of those people redeemed from humanity who did not compromise their faith in the Lamb. They are with the Lamb on Mount Zion. Now, they, they were not defiled of women. They are virgins. Now, here's what he's referring to here. Look at, go ahead and look at your outline again. Look at Roman numeral 4. Verse 4 says they were not defiled with women. This is not a sexist statement in the Bible. It's a symbolic picture of people who have not compromised their faith with idolatry. Because look at A, in the Old Testament, idolatry was called fornication and adultery because it took away people from the living God to false gods and idols. And even in the Old Testament, God compared his relationship with his people Israel as that of a husband with a wife. And when they went out and served other gods, it was described as harlotry, prostitution, adultery. Let me give you some examples. Number one, under A, this is Judges 2.17 describing uh, the people going after the time of Joshua, going after some of the pagan gods of their, of, of their region. And the person describes them saying this, yet they would not listen to their judges but they played the harlot with other gods. They prostituted their faith in God. They prostituted, they played the harlot with other gods and bowed down to them. Wow. And then Ezekiel used the same uh, imagery in rebuking Israel for their idolatry in his time. And God speaking through Ezekiel, God himself speaking through Ezekiel, number two, listen to this. God said, you erected your shrine at the head of every road. These are these pagan shrines. And built your high place in every street. Yet you were not like a harlot because you scorned payment. This is what God said to Israel. You are an adulterous wife who takes strangers instead of her husband. This shows the deep feeling of God when his people compromise their faith the deep pain it calls God because he has redeemed us. We're his people. We belong to him. Look at number three. Here's another one. It says, Now it happened when Joram saw Jehu. Now Joram is the son of Jezebel and Ahab. 
Apparently Ahab has gone off the seed and Joram is now king, but his mother is still living. And Joram is going... And he's going to put Jezebel to death because of all of her sins and leading God's people away from the one true God. And when Joram arrives at the palace, Joram, or when Jehu arrives at the palace, he's the one that is going to execute judgment. Joram says to Jehu, is it peace, Jehu? Listen to what Jehu said. He answered, what peace as long as the harlotries of your mother Jezebel and her witchcraft are so many. The harlotries of your mother Jezebel. Now, he's not talking about, there's no indication that Jezebel was ever unfaithful to her husband Ahab, but what she did, she promoted the worship of Baal and other gods in the land of Israel. She was not Jewish. She was a Sidonian, and Ahab married her and allowed her to bring her foreign gods into Israel. And so Joram, her son, says when he sees Jehu coming, is it peace, Jehu? He says, what peace as long as the harlotries of your mother Jezebel and her witchcraft are so many? My friends, do you see how God longs for that intimacy and faithfulness of his people to himself that he compares it with that of a husband and a wife? And when we compromise our faith, he compares it with committing adultery and being unfaithful. And under number three, this is referring to the fact that it was Jezebel, a Sidonian, who influenced Ahab to promote Baal worship in the land of Israel. And look at B. Remember, in the New Testament, the church is called the Bride of Christ, showing the special, intimate way that God views his people and that any resort to other gods is considered spiritual adultery to this special relationship. And so these 144,000 with the Lamb on Mount Zion, the fact that they are virgins, they have not been defiled with women, that is not a sexist statement. It is saying that these people have been pure in their faith. Even under great duress, they have not compromised their commitment to Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. <laughs> My friends, we must remain faithful in our relationship with Jesus. Now, this can become, you know, uh, today there's this, there's this big push all over the world and in America, religious pluralism. Uh, all, all religions are equal, and we just got to accept everybody, and, and uh, the God the Muslims worship is the same God the Christians worship, and we just need to be one big happy family. <laughs> And, uh, but then, you know, we can't compromise on that. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. We cannot compromise our faith in Jesus Christ. There is only one God who has revealed himself to humanity in the person of Jesus Christ, who was God incarnate, and there is no other way. Now, but let me talk to you, that's on a kind of a large, broad basis, but let me talk to you about maybe down on a more, what we might think is a more trivial, but not really so, intimate and small way. Because many things can become an idol in our lives that take us away from our commitment to Him. And notice, these are those who follow the Lamb wherever they go. They're totally committed to Him. My friends, you want to be a part of the 144,000? I'm telling you how right here. They follow the Lamb wherever they go. They have not compromised their faith. But you know, the compromise of our faith can be very subtle. I don't know, uh, if, you, if you read Sue's book, In the Spirit, We're Equal, and this just comes to mind, uh, Phoebe Palmer, and I think this is probably the presentation, uh, in the early days of her life, she felt that God showed her that her children, her small children had become, she had put them between obeying him and following the, the commission he had given to her. Many things can become an idol. I'll never forget my dad telling about, it's kind of a funny story, but very serious too, and some ramifications of it. Many years ago, my dad was in a service where 
a young preacher at the time. This was probably back in the late 60s, early 70s. Um, and it was Tim Young. Some of you know Tim Young. He's still living there in Paris, Texas. His son, I preach in their church quite off, very often, and they support this ministry. Uh, Tim Young was preaching, a young preacher, and, uh, and, and church, and the church, little church was full, and my dad was sitting between, behind a certain man that he knew. And this man loved to hunt raccoons, or they call it coon hunting, and he had some coon hounds that he really prized. And uh, so Tim Young, this young man, he loved to hot rod. He loved to build big engines and big multiple four-barrel carburetors and race them and so on. And in his message, my dad told about this, that uh, Brother Tim was preaching about how that there came a time, he said, every time I get down to pray, all I could see was this big engine with these chrome four-barrel carburetors on it and all of this. And he said, I knew that God was dealing with me and telling me that I had <laughs> to let go of my hot rodding, that it was in the way of my relationship with him and what he had for me. And my dad said this fell in front of him. Uh, his name was Buster who loved to coon hunt and had some prized coon hounds, said he was shouting, Amen, brother, Amen, you know. And, uh, and probably Tim wasn't even thinking of him, but said, as Tim was telling this, he said, he made this statement, I don't know what's standing between you and God. He said, it might be an old coon hound. And my dad said, Buster went quiet, never said another Amen. <laughs> the entire service. I was recently preaching at a church up in Oklahoma. And I was preaching about consecration and I told this story. And I asked the question, what's the coon hound in your life? What's standing between you and God? And God having his complete and full way in your life? After I came home, I got a Facebook message from the pastor's wife. She said, uh, your message was right to me. She said, I've had a coon hound in my life. She said, she said, I have felt so dead and dry. She said, the heavens have felt like brass. And said, when you talked about that, she said, I knew the coon hound in my life was playing games on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> and I had to deal with it. She said, now... She said, the life is back. <laughs> What's the coon hound in your life? What are you allowing to intrude and take you away from a complete commitment where you can follow the lamb wherever he goes and where you do not in any way compromise your absolute faithfulness to him? My friends, that's 144,000. <laughs> And that's a symbolic number. I believe that. Now, if you want to believe that it's 144,000 Jewish evangelists in the Great Tribulation, I'm not going to argue with about it. Fine, go ahead. I believe it's a symbolic number that applies to God's people, God's church right here and right now. He also says of them, Roman numeral 5, These 144,000 are on Mount Zion, which is another symbolic expression meant to express a very powerful truth. They're on Mount Zion. Now here's some, some, give you some facts about Mount Zion and even the spiritual application of it in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Look at A. Mount Zion is the highest hill in Jerusalem and it remained under the control of the Jebusites throughout the time of Joshua, the judges, and the reign of Saul, the Jebusites had built a fortress on Mount Zion, which was the highest point in Jerusalem. And Joshua was not able to drive them out. The judges, Deborah, Gideon, all during those, those generations, those years that went by in different generations, the Jebusites remained con in control of Mount Zion. Throughout the reign of Saul, the Jebusites remained in control of that highest point in Jerusalem. But when David became king, he went to take Mount Zion. 
And the Jebusites were overly, so confident, they were overly confident. Be careful about being overly confident in yourself. Yes, we could, we're to be confident in God, but not in ourselves. They were overly confident in their own because nobody had been able to deal with them. And they said, uh, David can't come here. The, bl the blind and the lame will keep him out. But David went and did what nobody else had been able to do. He drove the Jebusites off of Mount Zion. And now God's people, all of Jerusalem, belong to God's people. And what else did David do? He set up his own tabernacle. Now, they still had Moses' tabernacle it was at Shiloh. But David set up his own tabernacle, and he got the Ark of God, which was the only piece of furniture in the Holy of Holies, which is also called the Ark of the Presence, which was a, a, a symbol of God's presence. And he brought the Ark, and he set it up in his tabernacle. But he didn't have it behind curtains. In Moses' tabernacle, it was behind this heavy veil and curtain which nobody could see except the high priest who went in there once a year to offer up a sacrifice for the sins of the people. But in David's tabernacle, now David had an understanding of the, of spiritual, of the spiritual reality of things that were merely types and shadows. For example, when he committed that terrible sin, of having Uriah killed and taking his wife Bathsheba. And Naaman came and confronted him about it. And David was, was crushed and he cried out to God in Psalm 51 in his prayer. And in this prayer of repentance, David said, now normally, see, there were, sin, there were, there were sacrifices of different kinds of sins and transgression which people were to bring to the tabernacle and offer up. David said sin offerings and sacrifice you have not required. The sacrifices of God are a broken and a contrite spirit. Oh, <laughs> David understood that what God was wanting from him was not some outward religious formal response. God wanted to see that David's heart was broken because of his sin and the pain that he had inflicted on other people. God wasn't interested in some outward religious performance. He wanted to see a heart that was broken and changed. And so David had some understanding about what God was really looking for. And so he set up his own tabernacle and he brought the ark and he set it up where everybody could see. And he organized the Levites into 24-hour divisions. They were on, somebody was on uh, duty at all times. And in his tabernacle, they weren't offering up animal sacrifices. What were they doing? They were offering up praises unto God. 24 hours a day, day and night, there on Mount Zion. They were offering up praises unto God around the clock, 24 hours a day. Now, look at C. Here's what's, here's what's powerful and important. Mount Zion, John saw the 144,000 with the Lamb on Mount Zion. Mount Zion represents God's triumphant people. Our spiritual David, David's greater son, has gone up and he has taken that spiritual Mount Zion. He has completely defeated the enemy. <laughs> and he has opened the way for us. He has removed the final obstacle out of the way. And now we can follow our spiritual David by putting our faith completely in him. And we too can come to Mount Zion, that place of triumph and victory that has been purchased for us by our spiritual David, by David's greater son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me read some passages where even in the Old Testament, Mount Zion is spiritualized. 
Number one, under C. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God in his holy mountain. Beautiful in elevation, the joy of the whole world is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. Mount Zion, David said, is the city, the dwelling place of the great king. Well, we know in the New Testament, Paul makes this clear that we as God's people, we are his dwelling place. We are his temple. So in a sense, Mount Zion is God's people, God's triumphant people, those who have not compromised their faith, and they, they, they are Mount Zion. Look at two. The Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion. God's triumphant people rule in the midst of your enemies. Look at this, look at this New Testament application. Hebrews chapter 12, beginning at 18. And the writer of Hebrews, which of course he was writing to Jewish Christians who were being pressured to compromise their faith, to give up their belief in Jesus as the Messiah and go back to Judaism. And here in this passage, he's comparing the giving of the law at Mount Sinai uh, where there was this fire and there was blackness and darkness. And notice what he says, number three. For you have not come to the mountain that may be touched and that burned with fire and to blackness and darkness and tempest. But you have come to Mount Zion. You, you believers in Jesus. You have come to Mount Zion. Wow. You have come to that place of triumph where that last obstacle has been removed out of the way by your spiritual David. But you, and that includes you that I'm talking to, if you've put your faith absolutely in Jesus, unequivocally. But you have come to Mount Zion. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. He saw the 144,000 on Mount Zion. And the writer of Hebrews says, you have come to Mount Zion, those of you who have put your faith unequivocally in Jesus Christ. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. He goes on and on. You should read that entire passage. It's wonderful. Powerful. Many, many, many uh, uh, expressions about Zion, especially in the Psalms and in Isaiah. Isaiah has some beautiful expressions uh, about Zion. Passages like, Then the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion. Zion is that place of ultimate triumph. It is God's triumphant people because of what their spiritual David has accomplished for them. Here is a, a passage and uh, doesn't use the word Zion, but it talks about the tabernacle of David, which was on Zion. And this is the first church council in Jerusalem, Acts chapter 15, where they were having a lot of conflict over whether these new Gentile believers, if they had to become Jewish in the sense of the men being circumcised and being committed to keep all of the Jewish traditions and laws. And uh, they decided that no, they didn't have to become Jewish. They didn't have to keep all of the, the Jewish festivals and everything. That, they, that the important thing was their faith in Jesus Christ and, and that they lived uh, uh, sexually pure lives and refrain from violence and so on. And they gave some things there that these things were very important. But what I want to point out here is the words of James when he's summing up their determination. And he says, Simon, referring to Peter, who had told about how God had sent him to the Gentile um, Cornelius in his household, he says, Simon has declared how God at the first visited the Gentiles to take out of them, in the, the outline there's a typo, I said out if them, out of them, there should be an O there instead of an I, out of them a people for his name. 
And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written. Now, he quotes here from Amos. And Amos lived at a time when uh, uh, Israel had backslidden. They turned to adultery. The tabernacle of David had fallen down. It was no longer in use. And it was a terrible time in Israel. And, David, and, and Simon said, Simon has declared how God at first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree just as it is written. After this, I will return and I will rebuild the tabernacle of David which has fallen down. And I will rebuild its ruins. And I will set it up that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who does all these things. Now this prophecy of Amos, where God said, I will return and rebuild the tabernacle of David, here it is applied to the preaching of the gospel and God gathering people from every tongue and tribe, gathering them together unto the Lord Jesus Christ that that is that he is rebuilding the tabernacle of David. Let me tell you an experience I had many, many years ago, and I thought of this when I was putting this together. It's interesting how things happen years ago and then years later you, you, you see it in, in, in new light. This was probably, it's been over 40 years ago, but at that time there was a lot of teaching of, of what was called the manifested sons. It's still around and elements of it, but uh, it was about how that, there was this elite group of people of faith who were going to grow up and they were going to grow so great spiritually that they would overcome death. And they would overcome death and they would usher in the kingdom of God. They would drive all the demons off of the earth and they would set up God's kingdom. And then Jesus would come back and they would offer to him the kingdom. Of course, that is a, a real extreme. But then on the other hand, <laughs> at this time that was teaching the other extreme, there wasn't going to be any more moves of God. Revivals were over. Just had to sit back and hold on and wait for, for, for Jesus to come back and, and, and take us out of this evil world. And I remember I was disturbed because at that time there was a lot of teaching on both these extremes. And I remember saying, God, what are you doing? <laughs> God, what are you doing in the earth? I don't, I don't think this is right. I don't think that's right. But God, what are you doing? And the Holy Spirit brought me to, act, to, to Acts chapter 15. After this, I will return and will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. He's not talking about that literal tabernacle. But he's talking about calling out a people unto himself who will put their faith completely in him and receive the complete victory that he has purchased for us as our spiritual David. And he will bring us to that spiritual Mount Zion, that place of victory and triumph that place where we live in his presence. Not that we have to go around always feeling goosebumps or something, but we live in an awareness and a knowledge and a knowing that God is with us. He is in us. And we, out of that, we are continually living a life of praise. We are offering up sacrifices and praise and thanksgiving to him continually because our spiritual David has brought us to that spiritual Mount Zion, that place of, of, of victory in him and that place where we live in his presence. Verse 5, wonderful promise. I love this, this promise. <laughs> the psalmist wrote, Psalm 102. I love, Psalm 102 is a great psalm. I encourage you to read it just for the encouragement. You will arise and have mercy on Zion. For the, That's us, folks. That's us. We are Zion. We are God's people. 
You will arise and have mercy on Zion. For the time to favor her, yes, the set time has come. And then a few verses down he says, For the Lord shall build up Zion. He shall appear in his glory. He shall regard the prayer of the destitute, destitute and not despise their prayer. So, to sum this up, I am convinced, I'm settled in my own heart, that the 144,000 is a symbolic number of people who have not compromised their faith. They're totally committed to the Lamb. They follow Him wherever they go. They have not committed spiritual harlotry or idolatry with this world. They have not compromised their faith. <laughs> they follow the Lamb wherever they go. They are with Him on Mount Zion. They are with Him. They have followed their spiritual David to that place where that final enemy has been removed and they're with Him on Mount Zion. And as it says in Hebrews, let's go over and read it. Chapter 13, verse 15, I think it is. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15. And by the way, that's not too long after where he had said to these same people, for you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, to the heavenly Jerusalem. And here he says, Hebrews 13, 15, Therefore by him, that is by Jesus, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. How, when? Once a week when we go to church? No. Therefore by him let us continually. You remember in David's tabernacle? There was continuous praise 24 hours going around the clock. Therefore by Him let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to His name. Want to be a part of the 144,000? Give yourself completely to Jesus Christ. Commit yourself that you're going to follow Him wherever He leads. And you are not going to allow anything, not even a coon dog, to come between you and God's plan and purpose for your life. And by faith today, receive the fact that your spiritual David has driven out that final enemy. Your spiritual David, the Lord Jesus Christ, David's greater son, in, the, in the, the Gospels, he's called the son of David, but he's David's greater son. David drove the Jebusites, the enemies, off of that natural Mount Zion, but our David has conquered that spiritual Zion for us and brought us into a place of ultimate triumph and victory. Receive right now what he has done for you. I've often said it like this. When we know who are in Christ, we have a fight of faith, but it is, it is not a faith. It is not a fight trying to get the victory. We fight from a point of victory. We fight from a point of faith, from a point of victory, not trying to obtain. Jesus has already obtained the victory for us. Yes, we have to fight, but we, by faith, we say, Lord, I receive the fact that you have conquered every foe and that you have, brought, you, you have brought me with you to Mount Zion, to that place of triumph. And Lord, yes, there are enemies, but I am going to fight from this place of victory, totally committed to you. And I'm going to live in your presence. I'm going to acknowledge you're with me, you're in me 24 hours a day. And I'm going to continually offer up sacrifices of praise and thanksgiving to you. And Lord, thank you that in me and in us, may it happen in us, that the tabernacle of David is being restored. Not a literal physical tab tabernacle, but that spiritual 
atmosphere on Mount Zion, living in God's presence and continually offering up praise and thanksgiving to Him. And the Bible says that that is a key for mankind seeking the Lord. Let me read it again as we bring this to a close. After this, I will return and will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. And I will rebuild its ruins, and I will set it up that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord. Even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who does all these things. And remember, there at that first Jerusalem council in Acts 15, they applied that passage to what God was doing in the preaching of the gospel and gathering a people unto himself. So Roman numeral 6, have you made the commitment to follow the Lamb wherever he goes? Are you ready to follow our spiritual David and take over Mount Zion and live in his presence and continually offer praise to his name? If so, I'm, I, I, I can be confident in saying you're part of the 144,000. You're part of God's committed people ready to follow him wherever he leads. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you today. <laughs> Oh, Jesus, we thank you for who you are. We thank you, oh God, for the victory you have wrought for us through the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that as the writer of Hebrews said that we have come to Mount Zion. We've come to that place of victory and triumph and the opportunity to live in your presence because of what you have done. Our spiritual David, our Lord and Savior, you have accomplished it, Lord, so that we can live in that place. Thank you for it, Lord. I thank you for every person watching today. I ask you to give them inside understanding. And if there's anybody watching, they haven't made that ultimate, complete commitment to you. May they do it now. May they let go of every idol. May they let go of every hindrance. May they let it go now. And make that heart commitment to be totally committed to you. And Lord, what incredible joy, what incredible things await those who make that commitment. We thank you for it. And we give you praise. We give you honor. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. First song I heard when I went to Christ for the Nations in 1973 was about Mount Zion, Psalm 48. Interesting, our friend Bill Kaiser was up leading it. And it just went something like this. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in the mountain of His holiness. Beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north. Listen to this. The city of the great king. Yes. Amen. So, you and I, we are his city. We are his dwelling place. Let's just pause right now and just lift up a sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to him, to our spiritual David for what he has done, for the victory he has accomplished for us. Lord, we just lift up a sacrifice of praise and offering of thanksgiving to you right now. Lord, we thank you for what you're doing in our lives. Thank you that you are restoring that tabernacle of David in the sense of a people who will live in your presence and offer continual praise and thanksgiving to you. And Lord, I thank you for every person listening today. And I thank you for what you're doing in their hearts and lives. Thank you, O oh God. We give you praise. We give you glory. We give you honor. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Eddie? Yes, Sue? Um, would you uh, lay out briefly for people what your intentions are regarding the final lesson yes and what you are planning to do next okay now I need to do at least one more lesson in Revelation because one thing people have asked is about uh, you know uh, uh, terminology such as pre-trib mid-trib post-trib and all of that 
And so I'm going to do a lesson where I'm going to deal with that and also uh, with uh, premillennialism, postmillennialism, amillennialism, and so on. However, I'm going to do that as a recording, not as a live stream. Because what we're going to do the because, next... Because next Sunday you're scheduled to I'm, be... I'm going to be away next Sunday, so there will be, be no live streaming. Yes, our friends, if you're up in the Paris area, southeast Oklahoma, come out, be with... Uh, uh, our friends Charles and Delilah Hicks and others that come, we had such a powerful, blessed time there uh, last month. So uh, Saturday afternoon, 4 o'clock, then back at Sunday morning uh, at 10 o'clock. So uh, if you're in the area, come out this Saturday, 4 p.m., and uh, I know it'll be a wonderful, blessed time. So I will not be here next Sunday, so we're not going to have any stream at all. Tuesday, we're going to resume streaming, but I am going... We're going to begin, we'll have some fellowship and interaction here, but I'm also, we're going to do some teaching on Luke-Acts. Luke-Acts is such an incredible field with so much relative truths for us today. Not only about who Jesus is and about his power, his authority, his commissioning of his disciples, <coughs> but also about the early church and how it came about. And so we're going to begin that a week from this Tuesday night. Now, I don't know who will be here, but I've been teaching a Bible study here in this apartment complex. I put it on hold. I told them that I wouldn't start back until uh, probably in August, but I've had somebody email me, and they're kind of anxious. When are we going to start back? So I'm going to invite all the people that I have on my list related to this Bible study here. I'm going to invite them to come over and be a part of Tuesday night until we start back uh, the one that we do there on Monday night. And so we may have some new people coming in. And, of course, anybody is welcome to come. And uh, so we'll just see what God is going to do. But we'll come together. We'll, we'll uh, lift our hearts up to God. We'll uh, pray for one another. And uh, we'll just let the Holy Spirit have his way and we'll bring forth God's word. And uh, so that will be a week from this Tuesday night. But I will be doing a recording of uh, a final lesson for Revelation and bringing it to a close. So thank you all for being with us today. So thankful for what God is doing and I really do believe that God is doing a special work. I believe that God wants us to more and more realize who we are as we were talking about today, what he's done for us. He wants to, us to be a people that realize what he's done for us and that we will live in a, a continual awareness of his presence. That doesn't mean we go around uh, with goosebumps and shaking and, and, and groaning all the time. I mean, we may have some spiritual experiences, but we live, whether we're feeling anything or not, we live in an awareness, a consciousness of who we are, what he's done for us, and that we are his temple, his dwelling place. We are that tabernacle of David. And so we live in that consciousness, and we're continually offering up praise to him. And, uh, and as that becomes more and more reality, I just believe that we're going to just see some incredible things unfold now and in the days ahead. So look forward to seeing you on, on Facebook or email or whatever. If there's anything we can do for you, pray with you about. There is one situation I'd like to pray about, and I'm sure that this person, I suspect he will be coming because he's been, he has really reached out uh, to us in these Bible studies. And uh, a Hispanic brother, I think you met him, Richard Hernandez. And, uh, and uh, Richard, he had... I, I believe it was a kidney removed some time ago for cancer, and he just found out that it has returned. And so he's very concerned about that. And so, uh, you know, I've told him that we would pray for him. So would, would you just pause right now and let's lift up a prayer for Richard Hernandez. He lives right here in this same complex. I suspect that when he finds out about Tuesday night, he will be coming. But um, uh, just, just want to ask that God will touch him that God will heal him, and that God will just do a special work in his life and, and unfold and open what he has for Richard for his future. Lord, thank you for Richard. He's a new friend, and uh, I know that he loves you, 
And Lord, he has this, this issue with this cancer that has returned. He's having a test on the 29th, a new test. And so Lord, I, I pray for your intervention in Richard's life. And God, if there's any uh, adjustments or tweaking that he needs to do to put him more in line with your plan and purpose for his life, show him anything that he needs to do on his end. And God, we pray that you will invade his life. We pray that you will intervene and invade his life. Bring him through this time in the name of Jesus. And Lord, I, I pray for anybody watching who themselves or their friends may be dealing with cancer. Cancer is a terrible thing. Uh, it, it is a, a demonic thing. And, and we curse and we rebuke cancer and the cause of it and the spirit behind it right now in the name of Jesus. And we command it to go from people's bodies. And we pray right now, oh God, that your spirit will go and your spirit will flow into people's bodies and blast out the cancer and the spirit behind it and the cause and make them well and whole for the glory and honor of your name. And Lord, we will give you all of the praise, the glory, <laughs> and the honor for it all in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm just going to take a moment and open up and just see if there are any comments, questions, or maybe, or maybe someone had a specific uh, prayer need that you wanted to share. And, uh, you're, of course, you're welcome to do that on... Uh, the comment section on, on uh, Vivio. And for some of you who didn't know, uh, the for some reason, the simulcast of Facebook did not pick up today. Um, and so uh, Facebook has been a, uh, a significant audience for a lot of people. So I hope they did find their way over to Vimeo and to things here. So uh, thank you all for joining us today. And I see Edie, Edie, we have missed you. And I'm so glad to see you back uh, up in <clears throat> Nova Scotia. And uh, trust that you're doing better and experiencing <coughs> in improvement in that challenge that you had. And I see Rhonda. Rhonda, thank you so much for all that you do. Um, and just thank all of you who were with us today. Thank you for your agreement. Thank you for your prayers. And Thank you for continuing to stand strong and be that company of people that God is raising up in the earth today. God bless you. Look forward to seeing you next, not next Tuesday night, but a week from Tuesday night, 7 o'clock, right here in the studio.